A couple announcements as we begin. Yesterday, Faith at Work, we had 25 of our congregation members participating in three different service projects across our, our city, um, helping out a, a neighbor in need, uh, working at a park in Argentine, cleaning that up, and also preparing some, some bags for the homeless. And several of those are available at the back table on your way out. If you want to pick those up, and then as you are driving around town and see someone who is homeless in need looking for a handout, you can give them this bag. It's got a clean pair of socks in it, a uh, bottle of water, some snacks, a devotional book, um, just kind of some of the, the essential needs that they need um, regularly as a way to care for them. So pick one of those up, and then it's available for you as you encounter someone. Today in our service, there's a whole lot going on, really exciting things. Um, we have baptism for a family, several kids getting baptized. We celebrate with them. Our, our, our children's ministry students who have been in Bible study throughout this semester are celebrating their faith milestones. So they'll be helping us with the creed and the Lord's Prayer and sharing the books of the Bible. So we're celebrating with them. We have a couple of students who are taking their first communion also today, and so we celebrate with them with that. Um, and then next week is confirmation for our eighth graders, nine students who for three years have been studying and learning and growing in the faith. Next week, uh, both services, four at the early, five at the late service, uh, will be standing up here and reading a paper they have written, sharing their faith, what they have learned, and, and who God is to them as part of that, as part of their kind of next milestone, stepping stone in the faith as they move forward. We get a chance to celebrate with them next week as well. We're excited for that. And finally, uh, we announced, I announced this past Thursday, I have received a call to become the executive director of a mission agency here in Kansas City called Lutheran Urban Mission Agency. I volunteered with them on their board for a number of years, and now the opportunity is to come on a full-time role, um, working with the urban poor, working with refugees and immigrants, and seeking to share the gospel with them. So, it's a very different ministry, the, the pastoral ministry that I've been doing for a number of years. Um, a lot of excitement, a lot of fear because it's so different. Um, so I just ask for your, your prayers and your thoughts over the next two weeks as I'm deliberating that call. Um, I hope to make that announcement two weeks from today. Um, so thank you for your time with that. Many of the announcements in our bulletin, even more online in the e-news. Love for you to take the time to read those. But right now, let's stand and greet one another with the peace of the Lord. the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your Amen. 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us new life and hope by raising Jesus from the dead. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. This time we invite our baptism family to come forward. In the last chapter of Matthew, Jesus gave his followers this instruction, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. The apostles of our Lord have also said, The promise is for you and your children, and baptism now saves you. Our Lord Jesus Christ also said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. In this sacred washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, God frees us from the sin and death we are all born into by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. By water used in connection with God's word, we are baptized into Christ and made members of the church, the living body of Christ. So today, you are presenting Jude and Annabeth and Ben for holy baptism. Baptism is not merely something we have done and then we are done with it. It is a spiritual resurrection to a new life in Christ, the first step of faith. That life of faith continues as we gather with God's people in worship, as they are taught the essentials of God's Word, as they learn to study God's Word on their own, and later on as they are brought to the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Parents are charged by God to bring their children up in the nurture of the Lord. Do you therefore promise to fulfill this obligation for these children? If so, answer yes with the help of God. Let us pray. Gracious Father, in many and various ways through water, you have led your people from bondage to new life. So today, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Jude and Annabeth and Ben, so that sin may be washed away as the gift of faith in Christ is given. Bring them forth as ones who inherit eternal life and eternal hope. To you be given praise and honor and worship through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
you know, our fourth and fifth grade students have been learning about the Apostles' Creed in their Bible class as part of their faith milestones. And so at this time, I'm going to invite those fourth and fifth graders to come forward and to help lead us in the Apostles' Creed, which has, has always been the ancient baptismal creed of the church. We'll speak these words all together, but they will lead us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, Jude, if you want to come forward, please. Lean over a little bit. Jude, Aaron Burns, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Anna Beth. Anna Elizabeth Burns, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Ben, Benjamin Lucas Burns, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. <laughs> And of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Not quite sure about all that. <laughs> May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and the Spirit, strengthen you and keep you to life everlasting. Amen. And for Jude, Annabeth, and Ben, children of God, receive the sign of the cross both upon your heart and upon your forehead to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. <laughs> No more water. I'm done. <laughs> we also give you these white napkins to, to kind of dry yourself off. Um, but, but also as a reminder that even though all of us are sinners and sin is like dirt, Christ has washed us in his water and we are clean. We also have some candles for you. Candles, a reminder that Christ is the light of the world came to bring us his light. It's a reminder also of how on Pentecost the Holy Spirit was poured out on those disciples and the Holy Spirit came and made his home in their hearts. So I'm going to give to you guys. You can hold on to that one and that one. Katie, I'll let you hold on to that for Ben. <laughs> But we encourage you to light this candle every year on the anniversary of this day as sort of like a birthday candle, a birthday in Christ as they have now become new creations in Him. We also have splash kits for you on the TV behind you, a gift in there for each of you three kids, um, so items in there to help you continue to learn and grow in the faith. Let us pray. Oh God, you are the giver of all life. Bless these parents and all our parents that they might rejoice in the precious gift of these children. Help them to be teachers and examples of Christian living for these children as they are strengthened in their own baptism so that they might share eternally with these children the salvation you have given them in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It is my joy and privilege to introduce to you the newest members of God's household, Jude and Annabeth and Ben. Would you please welcome them? Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> as they're going back to their seats, we would invite you to rise as we can continue with the confession and absolution. We who are saved by God's great grace are called to care for others and to provide for those in need. We confess that often we have not heeded this call. We have viewed the spiritual and material blessings God has given us as ours to do with as we please. Father, forgive us. Jesus Christ became poor for our sakes so that we might become rich in his grace. Through his sacrifice on the cross, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, by the humbling of your Son on the cross and by his glorious resurrection, you lifted us up, giving us victory over sin and death. May we, your people, Share the blessings you have entrusted to us with the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This time we pause to remember the Lord with our offerings as he has blessed us. So we want to be a blessing to others that they too can come to know his grace and his love and his goodness in their lives. So as you're able, we would encourage you to participate in the offering you can leave your gift in the offering plate on your way out of service today or use one of our online giving options. And we continue now with the reading of God's Word. The first lesson is from Acts, the third chapter. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is from 1 John, the third chapter. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. 
the children are invited forward for the children's message. All right. Good morning. All right. So second and third graders, you're going to come over here and meet with Miss Barb and everybody else. You're going to come over here by me. Okay. So while our second and third graders are getting ready, I want to talk to you a little bit today about God's word. Where do we find God's word? Where do we find it? In the Bible, that's right. In the Bible is where we find God's Word. And it's there to tell us how much He loves us, that we are His creation, and that He is always with us and He's always going to be near us. And so as part of our milestones, we have second and third graders who have been studying the books of the Bible. And this time, they dug really deep into the Old Testament to hear the stories, okay, of the people and the events that happened to show us how God is always with us and guides our lives. And so this morning, they're going to be our children's talk because they're going to share with us their favorite Bible verse and why they chose that verse, okay? So can we all kind of scoot over this way, and then we'll turn around and we will listen to them share, and when we're done, we'll close with prayer, okay? All right, guys. Stand against the devil. Good job. Hi, my name is Kaliana, and my favorite verse is Luke chapter 19, verses 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. I say I chose this verse because it teaches you that Jesus goes looking for you if you go missing. My name is Sydney, and my verse is in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17. But you are a God of forgiveness, graciousness, and merciful, so to become angry and rich in unfailing love. You do not abandon them. I like it because it says God forgives us and loves us. My name is Ellen. My favorite Bible verse is Philippians 4, chapter 4, verse 13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. This is my favorite verse because Christ is always there for me when I feel sad or weak. Awesome. Great job, you guys. Thank you for sharing that. I challenge, I challenge you now to ask some of the adults and others out here what their favorite Bible verses are and why. Okay? Well, let's close with prayer. Dear God. Thank you for your word that tells us of your great love. Lord, help us to learn it and to know it and place it in our hearts. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seat. I invite you to rise for the reading of the gospel. Holy gospel today comes from Luke 24, beginning at verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written 
that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we come before you today thanking and praising you for your grace that you've given us by rising from the dead. Lord, help us to turn to your word, to hear that message of forgiveness and grace and life, and to draw strength from it. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. What a joy it is to proclaim that great news, right? Although some of us, some Christians, don't quite get that same excitement of, of saying that phrase over and over again the way we do. When my brother first got married the first year, he and his wife spent Easter together. She came with him to his church, and they walked into that Easter service, and somebody greeted her right away, The Lord is risen! And she said, I know. <laughs> and about the fourth or fifth time, somebody said, The Lord is risen! She says, What is wrong with you people? So all of us as Christians know that great truth, but some of us don't really enjoy celebrating it in that way, at least, the way we do. And yet, it is that great truth that is the center of our faith. It is the great truth that we proclaim. But the question I want us to wrestle with today is this, is how do we know what we believe? The answer for us is this, is we know because it is written for us in Scripture. This is the focus of our gospel reading, and this is the focus of our attention for today. The gospel reading opens, and Jesus appears to his disciples, and he speaks this, this common greeting, shalom, peace to you, only it's so much more for them in that moment of, of all of their fear and all of their worry and all of their uncertainty, peace to you. And then he shows them his hands and his side, and he invites them to come and to touch him and to feel and to know that he's not a ghost. And he even goes so far as, as to, to ask to eat a piece of fish in their presence, to know that he is real. And then he begins to point them to the Word of God. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Why those three terms? Well, those were the way, the terms that the, that the Jews used to refer to their holy scriptures. They didn't call it the Old Testament the way we do because they didn't have the New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. So the way they talked about their scriptures was to talk about the law of Moses, the books written by Moses, the prophets, those things written by the prophets like Elijah and Jeremiah and, and, and Isaiah, and the Psalms, the writings, the, the, the poetry that was written. Those were their scriptures. And Jesus says this is about him. Verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Everything in the Old Testament, everything in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms was written to point people towards him, to prepare them for his coming, to help them see and understand who the Messiah was when he appeared among them. And if you or I try to read the Old Testament today without trying to find Christ in the pages of the Old Testament, we're going to get it wrong. Christ is the center, Christ is the key, Christ is the point of the Old Testament. And as we read through those words, we are looking to see how they are helping us understand the work of Christ and what His life, death, and resurrection mean for us. That's exactly what Jesus does as He opens their minds to see these Scriptures. Verse 46, He said to them, Thus it is written... In these verses in the Old Testament. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Our faith centers in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 
Our faith centers on the issue of our sin and the suffering and the, and the death and the brokenness that we created. And God's plan of rescue and salvation by sending his son into this world to live life for us, to die on the cross for us, to rise to new life so that you and I who would believe in him, who would be baptized into his name, might have the promise of forgiveness and new life in him. This is the center of our faith. And then Jesus goes on, he says in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. The disciples had witnessed all of these things happen. They had walked with Jesus on the earth. They had watched as he was crucified. Now they had seen his resurrection. They had witnessed these things. And now they are being sent out to be a witness to others, to help others also understand this news, this great message that Christ had risen from the grave. They are sent out to be his witness. And then Jesus ends with these words. He says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He's talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit who would be sent on Pentecost. As they are sent out to bear witness to these great things that Jesus has done, they are doing it not in their own strength, but they were doing it in the power of God's Spirit that He will pour out upon them. And Jesus is the heart and the center of our faith. And not just in this reading, but for 40 days, Jesus appeared to His disciples and strengthened their faith and spent time teaching them and guiding them and taking them back into the Word to help unpack and help reveal Himself as the center of Scripture and to help them understand why it was that He came and lived and died and rose again. But after 40 days, he ascended. He rose back up into heaven. He's not here with us now. We don't get that chance to sit and walk with Jesus and for him to, to, to talk and, and explain things to us. So how do we come to know and believe in Jesus? Through his word. That is the way that God has given to us for us to understand who he is and what he desires for us. I know it's popular in our culture to say that we believe in God, even to say that we are Christian, yet so often people, the way they talk and the way they act, the way they live, shows that they, they have very little understanding of who He is. I was with a woman yesterday. We were working at her house, that Faith at Work event, and she talked about God and believing in God, and yet the things she said didn't line up with what God says about Himself in the words of Scripture. How do we know who God is? And how can we say that we know Him if we don't know much about Him? Right? I mean, so many of you know my wife, right? If I were to tell you that my wife is six foot two, that she's blonde haired and blue eyed, and that her ideal way to spend a Friday evening is by retreating from the world and being by herself to read a book, you would rightly say to me, Pastor, have you met your wife? Because my wife is five foot six, she is Hispanic with dark hair and dark skin, and she loves, loves, loves to be with people. <laughs> Nothing I describe is anything like her, right? And if I can't tell you the basic facts about who my wife is, can I really say that I love her? In the same way, so many people say they love God and can't tell us the very basic things about Him. And if we can't, can we really say that we know and we love God? See, at Trinity, I, as I've been here these years, what I've seen is there are pockets and places of people who really, who really desire to know God and are really invested in reading and studying His Word. And then there are these pockets and places of people who don't engage with His Word at all. What is it that keeps us from listening to His Word? What is it that keeps us from making use of this gift of God that we might know Him and know His love for us? Now, there are any number of, of reasons, I suppose, but I want to highlight at least three of them for you today. And the first one is, is this, is for some, we don't believe that the Bible actually is the Word of God. Now, this is a, an issue that, that, that runs across all of American Christianity. It dates actually back to the Civil War. Now, you know the central issue of the Civil War was the issue of sla slavery. People in the, south, in, the, in the South thought that it should be outlawed. People in... No, I said that backwards. People in the South 
believed in slavery, people in the north thought it should be outlawed, right? Well, the, the question for our country was, was settled on the battlefield with guns and bullets, but the question for the church lingered long after the, the fighting had stopped. Because the church in the South had said it was okay to have slavery, and the church in the North had said that slavery was forbidden. So how do these two parts of the church now begin to reconcile and make sense of the fact that two different groups of Christians came to diametrically opposed understandings based on the Word of God? It led to this, this crisis of, of faith and interpretation and reading of the scriptures, and it's led to a split across all denominations. It separates Northern Baptists and Southern Baptists. It separates the Presbyterian Church of America from the Presbyterian Church USA. It separates Episcopalians from the Anglican Communion in America. And all of it centers around this question of, is the Bible the Word of God? Or, as others came to say, well, the Bible contains the Word of God, but some of it is and some of it isn't, and so you and I get to figure out what is and what isn't, right? It's, it's like the continental divide in, in the Rocky Mountains, right? Two drops of rain fall an inch apart on either side of that line, and the drop to the west will end up making its way down to the Pacific Ocean, and the drop to the east will end up making its way to the Atlantic Ocean, miles and miles and miles apart, that's the significance of this question. The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible contains the Word of God. It sounds so similar, and yet it leads us to places so incredibly far apart. And this division has run through the, the Lutheran church as well. So it separates the Missouri Synod from the ELCA. And for those of you who have been Lutherans for a long, long time, you might remember this back in the 70s, this issue called the Seminex, where it sort of blew up in our own denomination. And a group of, of, of people in our church body chose to walk away and join this group that said the Bible only contains the Word of God rather than saying the Bible is the Word of God. If you've been a long-time member, not just a, a Lutheran, but a long-time member of Trinity, you may even remember how that fight played out in our own congregation. That Trinity took a vote and came this close, just a handful of votes away from leaving and following that other group. And that's affected our history and our culture of who we are. It's, it's given us this, this sort of rebellious spirit. And we'll just kind of thumb our noses at authority and try new things for the sake of the gospel, which is a very good piece about who we are. But the other equally important piece about our culture is that we chose to stay in the Missouri Synod and chose to hold on to this truth that the Bible is the Word of God, right? And this is, this is, this is God's answer. This is the way God addresses this question. Jesus treats the Bible as the Word of God, right? I mean, Jesus doesn't say, oh, well, you've heard it written long ago, but, well, I know there's all these manuscript errors and things that have crept in, so we really can't trust that word anymore. Jesus doesn't say, well, I know it was said long ago, but cultures have changed and times have changed, and, and maybe that stuff is outdated. We don't have to pay attention to that. What Jesus says, thus it is written. These things were written that you might know that you might believe. Jesus treats all of the Old Testament scriptures as the Word of God. And so you and I, who are followers of Jesus, also treat the Bible as the Word of God. Now, it's been decided for a number of denominations. It's been decided within our church body, but it's still a question for each of us individually. Will you trust and believe that the Bible is the Word of God or we would say, well, the Bible, maybe it contains some of the Word of God, but there are some errors there, and there are some things that probably aren't part of His Word, and of course, then you get to decide what is and what isn't, right? When issues come up, when the Bible says things that are difficult and challenging to follow, and it would be a whole lot easier if we could ignore that part of Scripture. When the Bible says something that doesn't match up with what our culture says, and if we hold on to that Word of God, we're accused of being judgmental and, and, and critical of people. Will we hold on to the Word of God and trust it as our guide and our source and our norm? Or will we say, well, maybe not those parts? This is the question that lies before us. 
My friends, we believe the Bible is the Word of God, divinely inspired, inerrant, God's choice, God's tool, God's gift to us that we might know Him and follow Him. The Bible is the Word of God. So here's the second reason why sometimes it's hard for us to read that Word of God, much less theological than that first piece. The second part is this, is that sometimes there's just too many distractions in life, right? So I have this weather app on my phone, and I can get the 10-day forecast, only I have to scroll up a little bit to see all 10 days, right? And after day 10, guess what comes? A couple of advertisements, right? Only it, it's, it's, it's comical and embarrassing to me how many times I have caught myself scrolling and keep scrolling, right? And nothing good comes after day 10, right? It's just, <laughs> it's just advertisements, I've, I've tested this out for a minute and just paged through. Nothing else pops up. And yet time and time and time again, I find myself, day 10, scroll, 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 right? We're just so trained in life. So many things work this way. Just keep paging through, paging through. Maybe I'll get to something. Oh, hey, look, there's an article by Andy Reid. I didn't know that. Paging through, paging through. There are so many distractions in life, whether it's your weather app or whether it's Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or whatever your social media app of choice is. We're conditioned just... Scroll through, keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling, right? And it's not just our phones and our social media, right? There have been more books written in the last 50 years than in the rest of history combined. You cannot keep up with the amount of information that is being pumped and forced at you. And there are so many activities and so many kids' sports games and so many vacations and so many opportunities and so many ways to fill your time. There is not a spare moment available to us without somebody clamoring for its time and attention. So many distractions in life. How do we deal with that? God's answer is this. That the Bible is His guidance for life. It is his instruction on the way the world works and the way the world works best. It is his instruction on how God has rescued us from our own mess. In John 20, John writes, These things are written that you may have life in his name. Have it to the full. Right? God gives us this gift of his word that he might guide us. It's been said that you make time for what is important right? There's, there's so many things. There's not enough time in the day for everything. So you always have to make choices about priorities, about how you're going to spend your time. And you base it on what you think is important. And as we come to see and understand and value the gift that God gives us in His Word, how He guides us and how He assures us of His love and how He promises us new life, as that becomes important to us, we find ways to set aside those distractions, and hear from Him. And the third thing is this, is that sometimes reading His Word just feels too intimidating, right? There are things in places where it's just hard to make sense of. I mean, even Peter, in his second letter, 2 Peter 3, he writes, Paul, Paul writes some confusing things in his letter which are hard for us to understand. I mean, if even Peter, who is, who is the head of the church who walked with Jesus is confused by the Bible, then what chance do you and I have to make sense of these things, right? It can be confusing. It can be intimidating to make sense of these things. We don't know enough. We can't put the pieces together. There's these words that just don't make sense to us. And so we're intimidated, and we don't even start. But here's God's answer. God promises that He will help us understand Verse 45 of our gospel reading today, it says, Jesus opened their minds. All of those disciples had walked with Jesus for three years. They had seen the things He had done. They had heard Him teach and preach and do miracles, and still they missed it when the time came and when He was betrayed and arrested and crucified. And so he appears to them again, and he opens their minds to understand the Scriptures. And then he said in verse 49, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the helper, 
who was poured out on Pentecost, who was poured out on each of us in the waters of baptism like we witnessed today, who lives in our hearts and who works in us to help us understand those scriptures. Hebrews 4 says the word of God is living and active. It is not just a set of static words on a page. And when we read it, it is our minds trying to make sense of those words. But as we read, God promises His Spirit is at work within us, helping us to make sense of those words, helping it to take root deep inside of us and begin to grow and flourish in us. So my encouragement to you is even if the word feels intimidating, to just start, right? Just pick it up and begin. Pick the low-hanging fruit. If you come across a passage that doesn't make any sense, don't feel like you have to stay there and spend 18 hours researching online and finding all these commentaries to make sense of that. Just turn the page. Go on to something else. You will find a part that does make sense to you, that enriches your life, that helps you understand God and His grace better. And as you continue to read, as you continue to study, as you continue to grow, eventually you'll come back around to that part that was confusing to you. And with the benefit of all the other things that you've learned and grown in, now it will begin to make a little bit more sense. The other piece of this, the other encouragement to you is this, is to gather with others. Do you recognize that that this this community, this gathering together, this is not our idea. This is God's idea. God created us and designed us for community. He designed us to be in relationship with others. He put others around us to walk with us in this faith, to bear our burdens when we're struggling and in sorrow, and also to encourage us and also to help us understand His Word. And as we gather in a Bible study, we have others who were there to help us understand that we can gain insights from them, they gain insights from us, and together it makes more sense. Community is His idea and is His gift. My friends, there are Bible studies throughout the week here at Trinity. Here on Sunday morning, the Bible study hour, Wednesdays during the day, Wednesdays at night, any number of times and opportunities, even some available online where you can tune in and join with others in the study of this word, and that word becomes more real and more vital in your life. My friends, Jesus came. He lived his life for us. He gave his life on the cross that we might have life in him. And he has given us his word that we might read it and come to know his great saving work for us and that by reading it, we might have life in his name My friends, may you treasure the gift of that word each and every day. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to rise. Having confessed our faith in the Apostles' Creed during the baptism, we continue with our song of the day.
us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, in your presence, we find fullness of joy. By your right hand, Christ Jesus, you win and deliver peace forevermore. Lord, you give us the gift of your word that we might know your love for us and that we might be your witnesses to that grace in the world. Lord, help us to treasure that word each and every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for the leaders of our world. We pray that you would give them wisdom, compassion, a desire to use their roles for the good of others and not for selfish gain. Lord, bring your peace into the troubled regions of this world. Bring an end to the fighting and bloodshed. And open doors that your saving name might be proclaimed to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all comfort, you have compassion on those who are afflicted. Grant comfort to Kurt Catter Henry on the, on the death of his father, Bill. Remember and have mercy on Don MacArthur, Justin Schmidt, Mark Schultz, Ben Stroker, Joan Vaughn, Richard Wynn, Shelley Archer, Kathy Dobbins, Jamie Peck, Carter Nice, as well as those we name in our hearts before you now. We pray for healing and deliverance for all in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, pray for myself and for the people of Trinity and for the ministry of Luma as I have now received a new call. We pray, Lord, that by your spirit you would reveal your desires for us. Lord, help us to hear your call, to follow wherever you lead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness in our lives. We rejoice with all those who celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, and other life milestones. We especially rejoice with Ken and Diane Ely as they celebrate their 66th wedding anniversary this week. Give us thankful hearts that acknowledge your blessings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> and now we have the great joy and privilege of coming to the table of the Lord where Christ comes among us again to feed us with his body and blood, to fill us with his grace and strengthen our faith. So we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also we took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. At this time, we invite some of our children to come forward and lead us in praying the Lord's Prayer. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our Lord gives us this meal as a meal of His forgiveness and grace, and He invites to His table all those who desire the gift that He offers here. And so if you are a baptized Christian who recognizes your sin and your need for God's grace, and if you trust in that promise that, that here in this meal of bread and wine, that Christ is, is really present among us, forgiving our sins and, and strengthening our faith, we would welcome you to come and receive His grace with us in this special way. Welcome to the table of the Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> Mystery. 
And now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you in true faith to life everlasting. Go now in his peace and joy. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We join us in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We join our closing song. risen indeed. Hallelujah. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.